Welcome to Histology. This video will provide an introduction to the histology component of your first unit of medical school. Answering the question, what is histology, seems a good place to begin, although you will see that arriving at an answer is not a simple matter. The typical dictionary definition is that histology is the study of tissues. Histo means web or tissue in Greek. However, you may not be entirely sure what tissues are, in which case this definition is not very satisfying. We will discuss tissues in a few slides, so don't worry about that for now. The term histology began appearing around 1850, along with advances in the construction of light microscopes and related equipment. Although it would take several more decades to develop the theory and components required to make light microscopes of the quality we use today, the instruments at that time were improving, and scientists were developing techniques to study all parts of the body with microscopes. Now, perhaps a more useful definition of histology is that it is microscopic anatomy, the study of the body structures using the microscope, in contrast to gross anatomy, which uses only the unaided eye to examine structure. Today, microscopy includes many tools, such as the electron microscope but this introduction will only consider some basics of light microscopy. In practice, then, histology is the observation of stained sections of parts of the body using the microscope. Thin sections of body parts are required in order to be able to shine light or electrons through them so that you can see something, and stains are required because most biological material is colorless. So you need stains to create contrast between different components. This is how the term is used by many clinicians. What did the histology show? A family practice doctor, for instance, may remove a skin growth from a patient's arm and send it for analysis by a pathologist. She might call later and ask, what did the histology show? The pathologist will have prepared and stained sections from the sample and examined them with a microscope. Given years of experience, the pathologist will be able to classify the appearance of the sample as either normal or showing some signs of pathological conditions. The histology is what the pathologist sees, but the diagnosis of normal or abnormal is an interpretation of the histology. At the beginning, your job will be to learn what normal histology looks like for all the organs in the body though we will show you abnormal material as well throughout the semester, both because it is interesting and also as a useful contrast with normal. Here is a blood smear prepared from a healthy patient. We'll talk a little bit about blood smears in a few minutes, but I want you to contrast this image to the second image, which is a blood smear that was prepared from a patient diagnosed with leukemia. So there are obviously distinctions between these two blood smears and it is obviously important to be able to make these distinctions. In fact, making the distinction between normal and abnormal can be a very difficult task for a pathologist because there can be a wide range of both normal and abnormal structure depending on what is being analyzed. Misclassifying an abnormal sample as normal will lead to disease progression in a patient while misclassifying a normal sample as abnormal could result in unnecessary treatment. For us, histology is really concerned with the microscopic structure of cells and organs in relationship to their function, physiology, molecular components, genetics, and diseases. Histology is cell biology and physiology with an emphasis on the structures involved. In order to study the tissues of the body, we first need to distinguish cytology from histology. Cytology involves the microscopic observation of stain cells, but it does not require sectioning. In some cases, one can obtain cells from the body in a suspension that can be analyzed directly. Sometimes an entire organism or structure can be placed directly onto a microscope slide, although this isn't as common when studying human tissues. This technique is useful to preserve structural relationships. This particular example shown here on the right is a flat mount of a mouse retina showing the retinal ganglion cells, which are the cells that are destroyed in glaucoma. Another technique 
often called a squash preparation, is useful for counting of cell numbers or seeing individual details. The third type of preparation is called a smear. This is useful for blood cells, swabs from the mouth, or from the vagina, and that procedure is called a pap smear. In this case, samples are obtained by sticking a needle in an organ and withdrawing material called fine needle aspirates. This material can be placed on a slide, stained, and directly examined, and this is because the samples are thin. This next diagram shows the steps in making a blood smear with the micrograph on the right showing the resulting stained blood cells. This is a very common procedure, and some of you will get to make blood smears in a few weeks. Everyone will be looking at smears of blood and bone marrows in the lab. Histology implies sectioning biological material before staining and observing it with a microscope. Here you see several sections that were taken from human skin. In the section on the right, you can see a number of different hair follicles. A typical sample preparation involves several steps and takes time, from many hours to more than a day, depending on the urgency with which results are needed. You can follow the steps in the diagram starting on the left with obtaining a sample. This may be a small piece of tissue removed from the body, a biopsy, or a small portion of a larger piece removed during surgery. Samples are small, both to speed up the subsequent processes, which are diffusion limited, and because only small areas are needed for observation. The sample is then fixed or treated with chemicals that cross-link into nature proteins and other macromolecules. This kills the cells and keeps large molecules from moving. It's a bit like hard boiling an egg. Heat denatures the egg protein so they stay in place when you remove the shell. After fixation, the sample is dehydrated or treated to remove water, typically by running it through a series of increasingly concentrated alcohol solutions, ending at 100% alcohol. The alcohol is then replaced with a different organic solvent or cleared. The second solvent is used to introduce a material like wax or plastic resin, which will infiltrate the sample. When that step is complete, the wax is allowed to harden or the plastic polymerized. This embeds the sample in a hard matrix that will allow it to be sectioned. Sectioning is done with a machine called a microtome. It moves the sample up and down, each cycle advancing it towards a knife a fixed short distance, such as five microns, to make thin sections. The sections are then collected on glass slides. If the sample was embedded in paraffin, that is removed with organic solvents. The sample is rehydrated and treated with stains. Finally, a clear mounting medium is added and a thin glass cover slip is placed over the section. When the mounting medium hardens, the slide is ready for the microscope. As mentioned earlier, staining the sections is required in order to create contrast between different parts of the cell. Most biological material is colorless with the exception of red blood cells and some pigmented structures such as found in the eye. There are many different staining mixtures designed for revealing different things and we will look at a number of these different stains over the course of the semester. But probably the most common stain used in histology is a mixture of hematoxylin and eosin called H&E. This is certainly used widely in pathology laboratories. Hematoxylin is a dark blue molecule that is positively charged. Therefore, it binds to acidic structures such as the DNA packaged in the cell's nucleus, and it stains nuclei dark blue or purple. Eosin is a pink red molecule that is negatively charged. It binds to basic molecules such as the arginine and lysine residues on proteins. It also binds to collagen. This tends to give the cytoplasm of cells a lighter red, orange, or pink color. Now let's take a look at an H&E stained section of rat liver. Seen here is an H&E stained section of rat liver. H on this section stands for hepatocytes, which are the liver cells, while S represents sinusoids, which are a type of capillary containing the red blood cells. The nuclei of liver cells are round, so they appear as dark blue circles in this preparation, while the cytoplasm of the liver cells is a magenta color in this case. You will find that H&E staining results in a wide range of colors, from pale pink to deep magenta. This is due to variations in the composition of tissues, in the many steps involved in preparing tissues, and in the actual recipes and age of the stains, 
which may differ from lab to lab. Those of you who actually prepare blood smears will inevitably see that your slides will differ from those of your colleagues in part due to the, sta to the staining preparation. This inevitable color variation is one of the things that makes histology challenging and often frustrating for students. Color is useful, but shouldn't be used as the only tool. The red colored bean-like shapes inside the circle are groups of red blood cells, which you can see have stained a bit differently than the liver cells in this example. However, red blood cells won't necessarily look like this on other slides. Sometimes they are very pale and sometimes they are bright red. Now that you have an idea how slides are prepared, let's go back and consider the nature of tissues. What are tissues? Well, a formal definition is that tissues are groups of cells and the products they produce that share similar structures, functions, and in some cases, embryonic origins. That's a complicated set of criteria, which may not be all that helpful. So to make things more concrete, Histologists have determined that there are only four tissues found in the body. You'll better understand what tissues are as we study each one over the next several weeks and then look at the organ systems in turn. So very briefly, the four tissues are epithelium. Epithelial tissues are found at body surfaces such as the skin and the respiratory and digestive tracts. Connective tissue. Connective tissues are found throughout the body, providing general support such as a blood supply and holding things together. Muscle tissue is specialized to shorten or contract. Muscles allow you to move about, pump your blood, and propel food along your digestive tract. Nervous tissue is specialized to gain information from the environment, process that information, and control the activities of the body, from thinking to sweating. As we go through this unit, you will see that all the organs in the body are composed of combinations of these four tissues. And although the concept of tissues comes from work that was first done in the 1800s, it has stood the test of time and still provides us a useful way of understanding normal function and in recognizing disease. So let's end by taking a quick look at a section from the small intestine where all four tissues have important activities. So to get oriented, the abdominal cavity is found at the bottom of the slide. You will see this label appear dramatically on the bottom right. This is inside the body. The lumen is the small opening at the top. This is topologically outside the body and where food, which is called chyme at this point, would be found. Look just below the labels for lumen and you will see E, which identifies the epithelium lining the surface of the intestine. You can see that the dark nuclei are elongated ovals in this tissue. That is because the single layer of cells in this epithelium are very tall. Part of the job of this epithelium is to move nutrients from the lumen across the cells to be picked up by the circulatory system. The small intestine has an extremely complicated geometry and if the section happens to pass through the epithelium in a different orientation, as it does a bit to the left, you will see that the cells are cut in cross section, so the nuclei actually look round in that section. Orientation is another complication of histology, and you will have to get used to it for understanding the microanatomy that you see in sections. But don't worry, you'll get a lot of practice. If you look to the right, you will see a CT appear, or connective tissue. This is a large area of connective tissue, and you can see there are many nuclei here and not much cytoplasm visible. This is an area full of small cells of the immune system. You should know that the gut is full of bacteria, so it is important to have cells ready to protect the body from invasion. Now further down and to the left, you will see another CT appear. This is also connective tissue, which clearly contains fewer, fewer nuclei than the area above. This is a denser connective tissue that provides mechanical strength to the intestine. It also contains blood vessels and lymphatics to support the organ. This dense connective tissue can be used to make a casing for stuffing sausage just to give you an idea of its strength. 
Just below this dense connective tissue layer is a layer of smooth muscle, indicated by M. You can see that the nuclei here are elongated ovals. This is a band of smooth muscle that wraps around the circumference of the intestine. And just below that is another layer of smooth muscle where the nuclei appear as small circles. This is a band of smooth muscle that is running longitudinally along the length of the intestine. If you look even lower on the section, you will see a clear area between the muscle bands. This is a bit of nervous tissue that contains nerve cells involved in controlling the activity of the smooth muscle bands and this helps efficiently mix the chyme and transport it along the intestines. There's also another bit of nervous tissue to the right, indicated by the long arrow. We will look at slides like this many times through this unit. You will learn to identify the different tissues pre present and the cells they contain. Later, you will look at these slides to identify the organs made up from these tissues and relate the organs' functions to the specific structures they contain. We will also show you slides in class and lab where pathology has changed the organization of these tissues. Histology gives you a rich vocabulary for describing the body as well as a set of images that many find useful for relating anatomy and physiology to function. Don't worry if much or all of this is new and somewhat mysterious at the moment. Over the next few months, I promise this material will become familiar.